Thank you. It's really lovely to be back again with you this evening and be able to share here in your meeting. And uh, as the pastor has said, he just wanted me to share very briefly about what we're doing in the next few months. Uh, most of you will know that we work with Acre Gospel Mission or Acre International, or I always say the farmers call us Acre. I wish I owned a few of the acres they owned. However, uh, we're really thankful to the Lord for what God is doing these days. And we're excited to see uh, God working, especially in Brazil, to see the work um, they're growing and souls coming to know Christ as their saviour. Um, a way back, many years ago, a couple called James and Dory Gumming left Northern Ireland, actually 74 years ago last month since they left Northern Ireland to go to Brazil, to the Amazon and the Acre, to the jungles of Brazil, and to take the message of the gospel. They were coming home to retire, and whenever they came home to get ready for retirement, the Lord challenged James and said, James, there's still a work to do. You see, there's no retirement in the Lord's work, is there? And said, there's still a work to do. And James and Dory went back to Brazil again. And they worked for another six years in Manaus, in, in, uh, in the Amazon, uh, looking after the missionaries and so on. And they were coming back home to retire when the Lord challenged them again and said, there's still a work to do. And they left there, it was in the late 70s, I think it was, or the beginning of the 80s, and they went across to the northeast of Brazil, three and a half thousand miles from where they worked in the northeast of Brazil, to the northeast of Brazil, to a state called Rio Grande do Norte. It was difficult those early days, there was a lot of persecution there, but God worked through them, and they saw many souls come to the Saviour. Well, to cut a very long story short, all down these years, God has been blessing and encouraging in the work there. And we today have now 16 pastors and their wives and families serving the Lord with us there in Rio Grande do Norte and in Paraíba, which is the next state down. And you know, we're so thankful for folk like you who pray for the work because God is encouraging us. God is answering prayer. And please continue to pray for the work there. The work in Portugal is very different because it's very hard. Spiritually, it's very difficult working there. But, you know, we used to send their missionaries all over the world and to Brazil. Today, Brazil are sending those missionaries back to us again. And we have a young couple who are coming across now at the end of this month to work in Portugal with us. They actually live on the Amazon in Manaus. Uh, they're very involved in the Hebron church there. Um, a young couple called Jander and Rebecca. And please pray for them as they come to Portugal to work. They're working in four churches, Beja, Cuba, Serpa, and Valle des Mortes. Now, Valle des Mortes means the Valley of the Dead. <laughs> it's, you can imagine, in most of those churches, there's two people, except in the Beja church. So they need a lot of prayer. They're enthusiastic, a young couple with a little baby, um, and they're coming over. They're excited about that, but it's so difficult to work there. And they really need the prayers of God's people behind them. So please do pray for them. Uh, and I'll be over for the induction, God willing. I'll be in Portugal in May. Uh, we value prayer for that. We're going to Fatima, which is the big shrine there. Um, the Pope was supposed to be coming in May. Not at our team, but he was supposed to be coming uh, to, to Portugal. He's not coming now in May. Um, if you saw him maybe on the television recently on the news or whatever, you'd see that he uh, has many health problems and he won't be coming. But a lot of people are already booked to come. And they told us that there's over 200,000 rooms available in Fatima, and they're completely booked out. So there'll be a lot of people there. We need people to come on our team. If you know anyone interested, it's still for May. We still have one or two places left for May. And then we'll be back there again, God willing, in October with another team. We also uh, have a team, uh, three of us, that are going out to Brazil in June. And we need prayer for that as well, because we're flying first to the northeast, and then we're flying right across to the Amazon, and we'll be there. I'll be speaking at the missionary convention there in the Hebron Church, and then flying back to the northeast to fly back home again. So a lot of miles, a lot of flights. I think there's about seven or eight flights altogether that we have to take during that time. And, you know, we just don't take these things for granted. We really do pray that God will protect us and help us and be with us for them. Then in the summertime, normally we go to Lanzarote in the summer. We're not being able to do that this year. But we have a team going to the north coast of Northern Ireland. Sure, how, what, what a better place could you go? You're all going up there for ice cream during the summer anyway, aren't you? And we would love you to pray for that. Because in Coleraine Independent Methodist on the Ballysally Road, 
is that the right road? Ballycastle Road, sorry. Um, there's a group of folk there, and we want to really encourage them and be with them. I was with them there on Wednesday night for their prayer meeting, and my heart was so blessed, I have to say that. And we're having a holiday Bible club there and doing outreach with the church. Um, I think it's the third week or the second week of, of August. There's details on the table out there. And if you know any young people that would like to come and help us for that week, well, we would be very glad of their help for the Holiday Bible Club. Um, It'll be Monday. Well, we're actually starting on Saturday to get ready for it, right through to the following Sunday. Um, We're we're hoping to have a fun day on the Saturday. We're hoping to go out, weather permitting, out and do some five-day clubs in the estates, which are next door to that, and also outreach as well with the Hope magazine that Good News for Everyone has produced a great magazine, and we're hoping to use that as well around the doors there. So we really do value your prayers for all of these activities, and thank you for the opportunity to be able to share one or two of them tonight. And and thank you for praying for us. A few magazines are out on the table as well. Our new magazine's just out last week, and there's a few of them on the table, and please do take them with you tonight as well. Um, We're going to sing, and this first song we're going to sing says, Here am I, so unworthy of the blood, but yet it flows. For me. We're not here tonight because of what we have done or who we are, but we're here because of what Christ has done for us. What's it called? <laughs> Sorry, just talk among yourselves a wee minute. Unworthy of you. <laughs>
were chuckling earlier about um, computers, and I'm afraid I'm like Hazel. I was bringing the children up when Keith learnt um, how to use a computer, so he has to turn me on, I think, with the time, Mike. There we go. I've just um, moved into a different type of job and work in nursing, and, and there's a lot of computer skills, and oh my word, it's um, it's the most difficult part um, for me. Is you know I don't even know the words icon and all these things that all the young people know about and um, all those things. But uh, the Lord is really helping me, and I'm very thankful for that. I'm going to read a, a psalm first of all that is very very precious to me, and I'll read it first of all. And it's Psalm chapter or Psalm 16. Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord, my goodness extendeth not to thee, but to the saints that are in the earth, and in the excellent, in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied, that hasten after another God, their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance, and of my cup thou maintains my lot. The lines have fallen unto me in pleasant places, yea, I have a goodly inheritance. I will bless the Lord, he has given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. This is that, the verse that I love. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life and the presence in thy presence is fullness of joy. At the right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I um, was sitting today and, you know, we, as Christians, the Bible says that we should be always ready to give a reason for the hope that is within us. And we have, I'm so glad that I have a testimony to give. And I was sitting today preparing for it, uh, just again, that, to keep it fresh and that the Lord would help me to highlight parts of my life and my story that would be of benefit. And I was thinking about um, my upbringing. And I, I'm one of those um, girl, wee girls from Northern Ireland who lived in a housing estate and it was part of the time in life and in our wee country that in the estates, you know, your mummy could have gone and asked for a, a cup of sugar when she'd run out. And um, it was the days when you got sent out in the morning. When we lived in the development, there was fields beside us. We went out and had dens and made mud pies. And your mummy shouted and you came in for your dinner. And your daddy came in. My dad was a motor mechanic. He came in with his dirty boots on and his greasy hands and mummy had the dinner on and chased the dog round the, the backyard with a pressure cooker. We thought that was great fun and that was the life that we lived. It was the era young people asked your mum and dad about it later of Charlie, Char, um, Charlie's Angels and Starsky and Hutch and there are videos to prove that we did try to jump in the cars the way Starsky and Hutch did. That was our, our upbringing. It was a very, very happy home. It was a home, and these are the exact words, and I can always remember this. I remember my dad saying, and this was the, what it, how it was, see these good living people, they just take it far too far. And we were a very happy home. There was no real, um, no dramatic things went on. Mum and dad took us to church the odd time. We didn't do anybody harm. We were good to our neighbours, and that's how it was. And that was the background that I came from. During that time, we attended a church and um, we lived in Hillsborough in those days. 
And when we left the church, the Sunday school superintendent gave, gave me and my brother and sister um, Bibles. And we moved on to, to live in Ballinahinch after that. Why I'm telling you that is that many, many years after that, he met me somewhere. We were a family that nominally just went to church. And he said, you know, Karen, I prayed for you and your family for many, many years. And I'm so glad to say that you're saved. I'm so glad to hear your mum and dad have become Christians. You know, we sit in our prayer meetings and we plead for God to work. And sometimes it's not in our time or it isn't in our time. It's in God's time. And keep praying and keep believing because God does answer prayer. And it is powerful when we stand back and see the wonderful things that God has done. I am so thankful for being brought up in Northern Ireland, for being brought up in a country where there is so many evangelical churches. We lived in the estate and three doors down, there was a, a man, um, Cecil, and you know, nowadays, safeguarding children and um, safety and all those things, did you ever play the game, how many kids can you get in your car to the, the clubs? And that's what it was like. And we were taken to the children's meetings. But one of the first times that I ever remember hearing the gospel, hearing that I needed to become a Christian and to use the words of Northern Ireland, that I needed to be saved, was whenever a car came into the estate, the plastic sheet was put down and there was people there with flashcards and a guitar and they were singing. Can anybody think who that was? It was Child Evangelism Fellowship. And that's one of the first times that I remember. I remember going to a lovely um, wee Sunday school on a Sunday afternoon, Miss Speedy. And when I look back, you know, she, you know, whenever you're young, you think everybody's old. And she, she seems so old to me. And, you know, she, just the love that she showed us and the care. And she taught us God's word. She taught us the scriptures. And she just showed God's love and God's grace. I am so thankful for all those people who prayed and took time out for me and to share the gospel. One of the big impacts in my life as a child was my far brand of a cousin. And she was, we're all about the same age. She was eight. I was about the same age. She's a wee bit older than me. She was, and one night we were overstaying with them, with them, and she said, you know, I'm going to heaven, but you're not because you're not saved and you're going to hell. And she started to talk to me. And she started to talk to me about this place of darkness, of fire where, where it wouldn't be quenched, the darkness. I was petrified of the dark. And I can remember that night. I can remember lying in my bed and knowing that I wasn't saved because I'd heard enough from these people who had taken their time out to tell me about the Lord and who were praying for me. I knew that I was not going to heaven. And I knew that I was a sinner. And God began to work in my life. And, you know, God speaks. And often it's from your pastor in the pulpit. It's often from someone that you work with. But God's spirit starts to stir in your heart. And I was eight at this time. Just around that time, we, we moved to Ballinahinch. And this cousin... Her sister, we, they were up in the caravan. We lived in Balnahinch and there was no phone. My mum was um, talking about this the other night because I was out playing Kirby and that's a great game. You couldn't play it now because there's that many cars but my brother came running down. We have to go up to Newcastle um, and he wouldn't tell me any more. But what actually happened was that my co younger cousin, she was just turning 12, and she was going up to Mournview Caravan Park and had her hood up. It was just after the 12th of July. And whenever she was in the middle of the road, she looked, but she had her hood up and she didn't see the car that was coming. And very, very sadly, a child of just not even turned 12 yet, well, she died two days after the injury. She just sustained at that time. Our ways are not God's ways. Our thoughts are not God's thoughts. It was a, a huge thing to happen in our family. You know what it's like when you hear the news and you hear things happening, you think, 
those things only happen in other people's families. And I can remember driving up with you know, my parents that night thinking, oh, she'll be all right, you know, be okay. But she wasn't. All there was was a dent in her car, in her wee bike. But the Lord took her into eternity. And, you know, it's so lovely because Alison became, was saved. And I'm so glad, you know, she, done, she was doing her daily readings and all those things. And I'm so glad that I'll see her again one day. And the Lord worked. It's sad sometimes that God has to use and do things like that, that, that stir us and make us think. And God began to move in our family at that time. And alongside that, we had moved to Ballinahinch and we had started going to a, a church in the town. And the pastor and his wife were, were sold out for God is the only way I can tell you. He was a real pastor. He came over. Um, he just was there. He was very practical and his wife. And at that time, my mum became a Christian. And she uh, became a Christian on Good Friday. I think that's a lovely time to get saved on Good Friday. Mum and dad, um, their life, you know, mum's life changed now, my mum, I always joke about this, but my mum loves to sing. And my mum sings so well that when she sings, you think she's harmonising in the wrong key. But she just loves to sing. And I can remember after my mum um, becoming a Christian, how that she would, um, you'd hear the tea stirring in the morning when she was just before we would get up and she'd be singing. And her life really spoke to me. And then my two sisters became Christians as well. One night, mum... Um, came home and she'd been at the ladies prayer meeting and she said Karen they're praying for you in the ladies prayer meeting well I was furious I didn't need anybody to pray for me I was coming up now nearly 14 years of age when you're that age you think you know everything don't you and um, I was so annoyed at them but God's spirit was stirring still stirring in my heart and in my life at, at home in the church I knew the people were praying. There was some very godly people that I could see their lives and I could see how God was speaking through them. I was so thankful for them. I was so thankful for the Sunday school and then the youth group. They would invite us along there too. And I'm just so thankful for people who gave up their Sundays, who worked five days a week, maybe six days, but then gave their Sundays to serve in their church. And God really worked. And alongside all that became, came CEF again. I was going to Good News Club and then up into Youth Challenge. And there was a camp. And I was a bit of a home bird. Didn't like to be away from home. And I went with my friends to Kilkeel to see View House. When I was eight, I was petrified of, of hell and the darkness. But that's not enough reason to want to be in heaven of fear. God wants us to realize our sin, to see him and who he is, a holy God. We are not deserving of anything that he would give to us. That song that we sang at the start, Here am I, so unworthy of the blood. This morning we broke bread in our own church. And when I sit and I break my, the bread and think of, the, of my sin, my sin on, on Christ that he bore my sin in his own body on the tree. And I am so thankful that he did that for me, that when I was away far from him, that he died for me. And I'm just so thankful for that. And we went to camp, and God really spoke to me again. You know, if God is speaking to you tonight, don't reject him. Listen. Because you don't know if this will be the last time that you will sit in a service where you'll hear God's word. You don't know what will happen to you. Your name might be the name they'll call out tomorrow in the news. Time is, goes by so quickly. Life goes by so quickly. And if God is speaking to you, listen. Because now is the day of salvation. I became 14 on the 17th of August, 1981. And a few days after that, at the end of the camp, I did see Christ on the cross. I saw my sin. I saw how bad I was before a holy God. And I wanted to serve him. I wanted to repent. 
And the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And just after my 14th birthday, I asked the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sins. I asked him to come into my life, to be part of my life. And he came and he washed me. And all I know is that he made me white as the snow, that my sins are cast into the deepest sea. They will never be cast up against me again. And I can stand clothed in the righteousness of Christ, not because of anything I have done, but it's all of him. It is his work. Now we're going to sing again. And this song is called Childlike Faith. And that's all you need when you come to the Saviour. It's faith to trust him, to take him at his word, to believe that what he says is true, and to thrust yourself upon him. Now I have to turn this off again. You don't want a solo. You can turn you down the back, can I? Yeah, you can turn you down. Thank you.
I was um, thinking there as we were singing that I can remember when I became a Christian. I can remember getting out the Bible and the Bible is the living word. And when we're dead in our trespasses and sins, the Bible says that the prince of this world has darkened our eyes, blinded us that we can't see. And I can remember the excitement as a born again Christian of God's word being alive to me and speaking to me, to know when I prayed that I had an audience with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I was uh, chuckling because uh, I remember in those days before I, I did become a Christian, I was really searching. And one night I'd come home from youth fellowship and we had this big children's Bible. And I thought, please, Lord, please speak. I knew, I just knew that I was not right with God. But there was popcorn in the house and I had sneakily taken this bowl down to the bedroom and this big Bible and been trying to, trying to find God. And I put the Bible down and I was going to sleep and the next thing I heard this noise, like a thud, thud on the pages of the Bible and it was as if they were turning. I was petrified. I think it was probably thinking about this place of darkness and hell and I really, really thought that the devil was in the room. I was petrified and called my parents. You know what it was? It was a mouse trying to get into the bowl to get my popcorn and it kept jumping up and falling back again and onto, onto the, the Bible but it really scared me. But God's word did become alive to me. And that was, um, I remember as a young Christian, reading Psalm 16. And as I have gone through my Christian life, I have thought of that verse, verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. And the next part I'm going to talk about and tell you about is those years whenever my stabilizers were taken off. Because... I was very blessed to be brought up in a church that was so supportive. I am so thankful for mature Christians who prayed and supported us and surrounded us with good Christian friends. And that's so important, young people, to make your friends in your church. And it's, it's so difficult. There was only three of us in school together and we stayed together and we used to have wee prayer times and I know there was, there was people that I had gone to school with and I would see them at church but they weren't taking their stand in school and I couldn't understand that. I mean, you need to stand strong and in a new workplace when you go to university, right from the start, and we've always told our boys that, take your stand right at the start because it's easier. When we were going through Sunday school and Bible class and I knew that my life belonged to the Lord and I wanted to serve him. It wasn't a chore. It wasn't a burden. I wanted to live for him. And we were taught to ask the Lord to direct us, as Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says, in all our paths, in our career choices, in the person that we would marry, in our, all these things. And I really felt at that time that I might even go in to work with Child Evangelism Fellowship. But I always had felt this desire in my heart to do nursing. And so I went to, Bible, or went to, to nurse in the Belfast City Hospital. It was way back in the days before university. And I went there. And that's whenever my stabilizers were gone. And I had to stand on my own two feet. I was so thankful that the church was praying for me at home. And, and yet, with shift work, I wasn't getting to church as much. And you know, too, you get tired after you've been working and maybe was finishing at five and I could have got to church. I was so tired. And it wasn't that I drifted very far, but I felt very cold sometimes and hurt. And I can remember one of the times... Um, some of the girls, I can't even remember what it was, but they were going to, and back in those days, sadly, it was discos and things like that. And we don't, young people don't even know what that word is. And I remembered going to, it was the Wellington Park Hotel. And I, I remember that night feeling so bad, so guilty. And I knew that I was in the wrong place. And we have to be very careful, don't we? We have to stick close, close to the Lord and stay close to him to do her quiet times, to pray, to know his word. And I was very unhappy. I could not wait to get out of there. And I, I just always remember t- 
chatting to our boys afterwards and talking to them about things like that and you know don't go somewhere that you don't you're not prepared to take the Lord Jesus with you and I, I just I'm so glad that I turned my back very quickly and all those things you know sometimes I do believe that the Lord does let us stray and then he just brings us back and he does that because he loves us and I approached my nursing finals and God was so very close to me. There was lots of things were happening in my life. And I was just so thankful that I, he saw me through those years and God's people were praying. And I did my nursing finals and got through those days and got, got my exams. And it's great when they, you don't wear hats now as nurses, but it was great when I got my Navy stripe and all and went on to nursing. And I went then to work in um, kidney dialysis. And I'm telling you this because, you know, when we set the Lord before us, he has a perfect plan for our lives. And it's so it's so amazing and so exciting to walk in God's will and in his ways. Some people think that Christianity and being a Christian is a boring life, and it is certainly not that. And I am so thankful for the life that, that we have enjoyed. And I always say as well, being married to Keith as well, um, he's a live wire, but you think you all know that. And um, just the adventures that we have had serving the Lord. I went to work in the renal wards in the city hospital and God was stirring my heart. I was very, very aware of all those people who did not have what I had. They had no hope. They had no peace. They had no joy in their lives. And I was very stirred to reach those people. And I really felt that the Lord was calling me to Bible college and it was the Faith Mission Bible College. And in as a young Christian, I was unsure and I put out a fleece and at that time there was a course called the renal course and it was a special course that you did to help you to nurse within renal and I said Lord if it's your will if I go on this course or if I apply for it and it's turned down I know that you want me to go on to Bible college and I was so surprised that I got on to this course because I really felt that I knew God's ways and I thought I knew what God wanted. And I did that, that renal course. I'm telling you that because for later on, after the course was finished, the Lord opened the door for me to go into the faith mission. And I, you know, um, I, I had been working in secular work. And I can remember sitting one day in Bible college with God's word. And I had been studying through nursing and the medical nursing books and there I was, and God's word, a living word, and I was studying it. And to be in that place, given two years to be able to study. And after we, I um, came out of Bible college, Keith and myself got married. It's an all another story. And we went to work in England. England is only a wee bit of water away. It's just a boat ride, and from Stranraer you can go now in the plane, as well you could have back in those days. And you know, the apathy and indifference to God's word, the apathy and indifference in churches. And so I remember somebody saying to me, you know, you've got that, but I have this, and the Christianity was your hobby. And we went there, and we started to work and pray, and we worked a lot with the children, and through the children, we were able to evangelize and have the clubs. We had a club right every village, as it were. We had one nearly every day and of the week. And then we would have fun days and bring the parents. Do you know, it was amazing just to stand back and see God work. There was a little girl there. I'm not going to tell you her name. But this wee girl came from a very dysfunctional, blended family. And this wee girl had two mummies. And we um, at camp taught them the 66 book. She came to the Holiday Bible Club and then she came to camp. And I can still see her standing up at the front singing the 66 books of the Bible. And she wrote to us many, many years afterwards. And we don't know where she is. Will you pray for her? Just pray that the Lord has his hand on her life. And that was for us a big shock going across to England. We moved up to Scotland. And 
there were times of, it was hard going at times, but we knew that the Lord was with us. And during that time, yes, we were there working with Faith Mission, but we were also there as a young couple. We were away from home. And then the next thing, we were going to be parents. And um, I was uh, pregnant with Matthew, our son. I don't know if you still play. Do you play Duck, Duck, Goose in your church? You don't play it in church, but you play it in the club or whatever. And I'd have been up running about doing Duck, Duck, Goose pregnant and doing camp and all these things. And coming up on to 38 weeks of pregnancy, um, I was told, pack your bags. You need to get, the baby is going to be here soon. And this particular day, I didn't feel any movement. And just the, the Sunday before that, we had been in a church and um, I had been up given, you know, shaking hands with the children and saying, you know, congratulations, you've done very well. And there was a lady in the congregation and she said, that girl should be at home with her feet up. Look at that poor girl. I didn't know all this. And that, during that week, I lost movement with the baby and phoned in and off we went to hospital. It was a very worrying night that night and in the end that we had to be rushed to theatre and we were told that this baby that was born wasn't going to live. I don't know if you've ever been in a position like that. You know, whenever they come and they start taking photographs of your baby and I knew why they were doing that. I don't know if you've ever had a very difficult time in your life when you can't even speak. But I am so thankful that God knows our hearts that he knows our heart's desires and he knows the cries of our heart. You know, we can sit in prayer meetings and, you know, we're afraid to speak because we don't have the right words to say, but God loves to hear his children talk to him. He loves to hear you pray. The only words that I could say during that time and that baby was so well was God and Matthew. But he, God knew that, I knew that that was all I had, that it was God and I wanted him to touch my son. He was born on the 8th of of April, and 10 days later, we took Matthew home on the 18th of April. Given not a clean bill of health at that time, there were concerns that um, maybe he would have learning difficulties. But he's now 28, and he's getting married, or he is married, and he loves the Lord, and he's teaching in Bible class now himself. And I can still see the day when he was five and he came down the stairs to tell us that he had got saved. But it was a very, very difficult time for us. You know, you think, Lord, I am serving you. I've done these things. And look what's happened. But, God, you know, God, God doesn't grant us anything. He promises us. He promises us that he will be with us in the difficult times. And he promises that he will see us through. We came back then and we left the faith mission and Keith went to be the pastor in Rafael and Baptist. And I became a pastor's wife and I went back and started nursing again as a tent maker, as it were. But I'm telling you, I told you about doing the renal course because whenever we are Christians, we start a journey. I think of that young girl who was 14. But we're on a journey and we're learning all the time about God. We're learning through the difficult times that we can trust him, that we can trust his word. We're learning that he's there with us, that his presence will go with us. He will give us peace and he will give us rest. And we, if we're with him and set him before us, we will not be moved. And we so adjourn with the Lord and we journey on. I was in my my job as a nurse and, um, I got a phone call one night to ask me when I was in another ward. Because the phone call said, look, because you've got this renal course, we would like you to come back and to work in a renal ward again. And it was only because God had closed the door and got me um, to do that course. And I'm working now in, a, in dialysis. Um, I am with people that are very close to eternity. They're very ill sometimes on dialysis. And sometimes the Lord has given me great opportunities to speak of him. We've just, sometimes as if it's just been me and that patient. And that's not because of me. That's because God has stirred that person's heart and they've asked me things. We need to ask the Lord to give us opportunities to to speak of him. And to be ready always 
to give a reason for the hope that is within us. I've moved into another part of work and it's um, teaching or helping people support them now that their kidneys have failed and maybe they're going to be a, need a kidney transplant and then working with people who are going to donate a kidney for a loved one. And I'm just so thankful for how the Lord has kept me, how the Lord has preserved me. And I think as I've gone on in this journey with the Lord, the thing that I have learned the most is that I am nothing. That is all of God. And these past few days or weeks, uh, I, I've been thinking so much about life here. And oftentimes, it's not so much as what we say as Christians, but it's what we do and how we act around those people that know nothing of the Christ. We need to pray that, the, that we would give off that sweet fragrance of the Lord, that people would take note that we are with Jesus. And that's, that's always my prayer. You go into work in, this mo- in the morning, you don't know what you're going to face. Um, even in family life, you just don't know. You know, sometimes when the dishes are left beside the sink or the washing still on the floor, that you don't just blow up, but that you always have a gracious spirit. It's not easy. But when we set the Lord always before us, we shall not be moved. And it isn't an easy life, but it's a joyous life because that joy comes from deep, deep within. And, you know, I I don't know anybody here. I just know that you have got lovely smiles. And I love it when you smile at us, when we're up singing especially as well. I don't know where your heart is, where your standing is before a holy God. But it would be my prayer that he would be your saviour. It would be my prayer that you walk close with him. That he would bless you every day with his peace and with his comfort and with his joy. And thank you so much for listening and for being so encouraging as well. We're going to finish now. We're going to sing another song. It's actually based on Psalm 27. And it's, it really is, Keith has to get his phone because all the songs are on it. It's, um, it was a song that the Gettys wrote, The Lord is My Salvation. The last verse says, And when I reach my final day, he will not leave me in the grave, but I will rise and he will call me home. The Lord is my salvation. That is our hope. We have an eternity in heaven if we trust Jesus as our saviour.
Folks, let's just bow in prayer and ask the Lord just to bless all that has been said and done tonight. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for the sense of your presence with us tonight. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful uh, saving grace of God. Thank you, Lord, that we can say amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And Lord, we thank you that you know every heart in this meeting this evening. And Lord, maybe someone who is not saved tonight, maybe someone who's cold at heart tonight, who's backslidden. Father, we realize that you're speaking tonight. And Father, we just ask that you will help them tonight, Lord, as you're speaking to them. Help them, Lord, not to reject salvation. Help them, Lord, not to neglect salvation. But Lord, help them to come to Christ while he may be found and while he is near. Lord, we realize that none of us know what tomorrow will bring. None of us even know what to, if we'll see tomorrow. Your word reminds us that our life is like a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. Oh Lord, we pray that lest someone here would go into eternity tomorrow without the Savior. Oh God, that you will work and that you will move. And thank God that you're the one who's able to save to the very uttermost. Bless us, Lord, as we go one from the other. Keep your hand upon us, we pray, and we'll give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory, because you alone are worthy. In Jesus' worthy and precious name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs>